welcome to our final session of this year's Ride Around the Murray Festival program. My name's Anne-Marie Wham, Festival Director, and I'm talking to you from the Aubrey Library Museum, home of the festival here on Wiradjuri country, where we pay respect to Wiradjuri elders past, present and future. A big thank you to all of you who, who are tuned in, including those of you watching the replay later. We truly appreciate your support of the Ride Around the Murray Festival and of literature and storytelling and the arts more broadly. We are thrilled to be able to present this session, Seismic Shifts, with Delia Falconer, Rick Morton and Ailsa Piper. Uh, thank, thanks to all of them for coming online with us, um, despite our best intentions of all gathering together in person. It's my pleasure to introduce Elsa Piper to moderate this session. Elsa is a writer, director and performer, last here for WAM in 2018 to discuss her wonderful book, The Attachment, Letters from a Most Unlikely Friendship, co-written with Tony Doherty, a priest with whom she struck up a correspondence following her first book, Sinning Across Spain, a memoir about her walking travels on the Spanish Camino de Santiago. It's great to have you with us again, Ailsa. Welcome. <laughs> Thanks, Anne-Marie. How lovely it would be to be actually with you, but this is, this is great. This is wonderful. And congratulations for pulling it off. Ah, thank you. Thank you. It's, yes, at least we can, at least we can gather virtually. Yeah. Yeah. Um, before I hand over to Ailsa to introduce our panel, I'll just remind listeners that you can type your questions for the panel at any time using the chat bar on the right side of your screen, as long as you're logged into Google, and we'll come to your questions at the end of the session. So enjoy the conversation, everyone, and over to you, Ailsa. Thanks, Anne-Marie. Um, before we begin, I'd also like to acknowledge that um, I am lucky to be living on the Gadigal lands of the Eora Nation, and I'd like to pay respect and gratitude to the elders and custodians, past, present and emerging. So, welcome to Seismic Shifts. Um, when Amory invited me to chair this meeting of Magnificent Minds, she said that their books didn't necessarily have obvious connections, um, but she had an instinct to put them together. And I'd, I suppose I'd say that having lived with them separately and in tandem for some weeks now, I think she was right. On the surface, they're really quite unconnected, but seismic activity isn't about the surface of things. Seismic shifts are about earthquakes and vibrations that shake the surface. And I would suggest that both of these magnificent books, I'm not very good at um, product placement, both of these magnificent books do just that. They shake the surface, but in very different ways. So I'm going to suggest that we might bring in the writers and you can admire them while I introduce them. Delia Falconer, hi Delia, is the author hi. of three books, two novels um, and one previous work of creative nonfiction. Her first novel, The Best-Selling Service of Clouds, was shortlisted for almost every major literary award in the land. Her second, The Lost Thoughts of Soldiers, was shortlisted for, among other awards, the Commonwealth Writers' Prize in the Asia-Pacific Division. Her last book was called Sydney, A Personal History of Her Hometown, and it was shortlisted for seven national awards in history and biography and non-fiction, and it won the 2011 Cal Nib Waverley Library Award for Outstanding Research. And now we have Signs and Wonders, it's an essay collection. Look. <laughs> um, sorry, that's my... <laughs> that was a seismic shift. <laughs> yes, I was going to say, we all know how we've lost poor Elsa. <laughs> this is the, uh, the uh, struggle of doing it from an iPad, I think. That's right. Well, I think we've lost Elsa temporarily. No, your book's not out yet, is it, Delia? That no, month? it's been delayed. Um, it was supposed to be out this month and it's coming out in October. And uh, that's just <laughs> well the done, Delia. times. <laughs> <laughs> well done, Delia. Well, if that wasn't the blonde moment of the festival, I don't know. <laughs> 
<laughs> we covered very well, don't worry. I'm so glad. Well, I know you would. Anyway, it's called Signs and Wonders. It's coming out, as you were saying, at the end of September. And it is about the big things, but it tells them through a lens that is very, very personal. Um, Delia talks about her literary ecotone, her small literary ecotone. And um, the book really is a work of wonders. So, um, yeah, we'll get to that. Rick, um, on the hello. other hand, <laughs> hello. Um, Rick is best known as a journalist and he's been one for over 15 years. He's the winner of the 2013 Kennedy Award for Young Journalist of the Year. And that must have been nice, Rick. I forget well, young it was journalist. Nice. <laughs> oh, but now it's like, that was so long ago. Why do I keep putting that in my bio? <laughs> oh, well, then you got the 2017 Kennedy Award for Outstanding Columnist. Well deserved. Um, Just but in the of limitations. <laughs> In 2019, Rick left The Australian, where he worked as the social affairs writer, with a particular fo focus on social policy, which really, I suppose, you know, is relevant in terms of both of your books. Um, and he's now the senior reporter for The Saturday Paper. He also is regularly on TV and radio as a commentator. And I'm told that you're a Twitterati, that you're very wonderful on Twitter, but I am not here. So. <laughs> no, you, you've made um, the right choice. Ah, well, that's good in one area at least. Um, Rick's first book was called 100 Years of Dirt and it was a memoir that told a truly harrowing story about a childhood in outback Australia that was not perhaps the land of, you know, billabongs. Um, the book was funny as well as being grittily honest and it was published in 2018. In 2019, Rick was diagnosed with complex post-traumatic stress disorder, what you jokingly call a fancy way of saying that one of the people who should have loved you the most during your childhood didn't. And so this book, The Year of Living Vulnerably, I'm not going to chop myself off. <laughs> I was going to say, watch out for your iPad. <laughs> <laughs> um, it seemed to me that it was a kind of a response to that diagnosis. Um, and in the book, Rick sets out to investigate love, to open himself up to it and, as a good journalist, to document the story. So that's quite enough for me. I'm conscious that as a, a reader, I've written my own narrative about how these books came about. You know, this one followed Sydney and this one followed... But, of course, that's got nothing to do with it. And I wondered if we could start by you just telling us a little bit about can you remember the first itch that you wanted to scratch that sort of made you think this could be a book? Delia. Um, yeah, I, I can actually really, um, really easily. Um, I, I'm coming to you from the Gadigal land of the Aurora Nation, the inner east of, of Sydney, and uh, I'm an obsessive walker. I was an obsessive walker before COVID. I'm probably even more of an obsessive walker now. And uh, I, you know, have my different routes and I like to, I've realised I like to kind of check off you know all my little lists of what's what's right with the world or what's you know what what birds what animals what things are there and um i was walking in Woolloomooloo and um one of my circuits is down to mrs mccrory's chair and um i looked into the water and i'm always sort of looking to see what fish i can see and you know usually there's you know a variety at least sort of some mullet and you know um some of those odd little sort of fish that look like tiny little submarines with little propellers on either sides of, sides of their heads. And um, I couldn't see any. And I had this moment of thinking, normally I'd think, oh, well, it's seasonal and the fish come and go from Sydney Harbour. And I thought, well, maybe there aren't any fish to see. Um, and I started, and I, and I was on this walk, I just, I just kept having this um, expression go around in my head, which was, um, I think I'm living in an age of signs and wonders. So uh, I thought, you know, I don't know. It's, it's, and I realised that I'd been having that feeling and I'd been having that conversation with friends who were similarly worried um, for the last few years before that um, about whether what we were seeing, whether it was a mighty, you know, once in a hundred year hailstorm or, uh, you know, an unseasonably warm spring wind through to Easter, um, if these things were... Um, wonders um, or if they were signs of um, some sort of unfolding catastrophe and for me that seemed to be the 
um, you know, that seemed to be the kind of the, the nature of our times in a way. And um, I just had this this intense walk where I just kept thinking about um, about this this what it meant to be living in a an era of signs and wonders, and how in some ways life feels um, just as precarious and as uh, full of sign and portent as, you know, the Romans I used to learn about in Latin class at school who would, you know, consult the auguries and look at the organs of animals or the flights of birds or the movement of different animals. And I thought, well, you know, all that stuff that, you know, we thought was, uh, you know, sort of comical actually uh, is is um, very much um, part of the kind of texture of life now. So that's that there's absolutely clear moment of, of knowing um, when this book um, came into being. They say that writing is entirely connected to walking, so mm, there's the proof, absolutely. yeah. And, and for you, Rick, what about you? You're sort of looking into your own internal organs in this book, aren't you? You're kind of being <laughs> yeah. your own yeah. organ. I guess I'm my own little Roman soldier, I guess. Um, I mean, this book was not meant to happen. I mean, I had no intention. It's so embarrassing because sometimes I get introduced to being the author of two memoirs um, and I'm 34, um, which is ridiculous. Um, but I, 100 Years of Dirt came out and there were a lot of really wonderful reader comments and feedback from people who are in psychology and whatnot, none of whom were willing to diagnose me, but some of whom said publicly, I don't think Rick has fully come to terms with what has happened to him yet. Uh, and I think I'd skated over, not deliberately, but I just didn't think that trauma was something that would ever have applied to me personally, um, which is <clears throat> ironically one of the kind of ways that it manifests is that you think it happens to other people and that you're um, you're perfectly fine when really it's worming its way through your skin. And so by the time I had the realisation, which ironically, um, I, I should stop saying that word, um, but at, it was at Newcastle Writers' Festival and I was listening to, um, oh God, I'm going to forget her name now. Uh, I mentioned her name in the book and she's wonderful. God, I feel terrible. I'll remember it later and I'll say it. But I was listening to another writer speak about what trauma was to her and I was like, holy shit, that, like, is, that is what happens to me. I thought I just had really bad anxiety. And so this book kind of grew out of a frustration once I got the diagnosis that I had never heard of complex PTSD. And then I'm like, well, no, it, it, it makes me sound like I'm being self-serving, but like I didn't want to write about it necessarily, but also I'm like, well, if I can write, research an entire book into my family's intergenerational trauma and still be seeing seven, eight psychologists in a decade and still not know about this stuff, either I'm a really bad researcher and I think I'm okay, um, or there's something worth delving into here because it's still an emerging kind of diagnosis. It's not particularly well understood um, or recognised even in some countries. And so I just, I knew I needed to do it, but I, I didn't want to do it through a kind of a deficit prose I wanted to talk about things that I find beautiful and it, it fits perfectly with the diagnosis because you know it's caused by a removal of love that should be there and so I just went about vigorously trying to put the love back. Mm. Mm. Love. That's a lovely mm. way to kind of frame it putting the love back. Um, yeah brick by brick. Yeah yeah uh, I'm interested in the idea of the difference between signs and wonders um, for, for both of you because you actually both uncover some wonders. Delia, do you want to just um, unpack that a little and then I'd like you to both talk about your seals because you both have seals and <laughs> they're kind of mad. So do you want to just frame it for us, Delia? Sure. Um, uh, well, I think one of the things about living in this moment that some people are, you know, calling the Anthropocene and it's a handy term for, you know, human-made, um, you know, climate, un unfolding chaos, you know, things, are, we can feel it, things are kind of going going off scale more and more. Um, they're becoming, you know, weather, you know, heavier animals, all sorts of things are becoming less and less predictable. Um, part of that awareness that I think we have is that, you um, Things that, that beauty can seem to be uncanny. I think I heard I heard somebody say that um, we can't experience beauty simply anymore because I think there's always at the moment this concomitant feeling that um, you know maybe it's going to be lost, maybe um, you know maybe it's 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 very precarious, and so a sunset becomes you know both uh, you know freighted with this knowledge as well, this wonder about whether it's um, 
actually you know a sign of of you know um of of bad things to come or you know global global heating and so forth um that's one side of it the other side is that um these uh, changes that are taking place at the moment are still often quite beautiful and they are wondrous. They are. Um, so I started to collect some of the wonders that have been coming through my feeds. You know, I am, a, you know, addicted to Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. And, you know, it felt like I was looking at my phone and, um, you know, you there were um, so in the in the period of um, drought in 2018 summer in Europe, uh, all these phenomena were appearing like, um, I think my favourite is parch marks. So um, when you have extreme drought, what happens is that you start to see in the um, in the growth of the, the, the darker, greener grass, um, next, which has sort of straw, parched straw around it, um, the foundation, the footprints of all these things were just emerging out of the earth, like whole Neolithic villages. You could see the, the shape of them aerially, um, you know, old mansions, um, you know, extraordinary things. And then out of the Antarctic and out of the, rather the Arctic um, permafrost, we are seeing almost every day, um, you know, Len uh, Lenskaya pony foals that haven't been sighted um, before, mammoths, you know, there's millions of mammoths apparently under the permafrost and, and we're starting to see more and more wolf cubs. Um, and, you know, at the same time as the world is becoming more precarious, we're also starting to understand quite how extraordinary it is so um i mean you know, i think everyone's quite familiar these days with the you know the idea um that we're discovering more about say trees and the fact that they inhabit what's called a you know people jokingly call the wood wide web um where trees <laughs> feed you know orphan trees um you know are fed through underground networks um sugar by the older trees um there's some sense that they can communicate that they can um, exude um, some form of, of um, sort of po semi-poisonous resin if they're being attacked by insects and things like that. So we have that, um, you know, that, that, that incredible sense that the world is, again, sort of almost becoming more fairy tale like you know, all the things that we intuited as kids seem to me to be almost to be becoming true, that, you know, that fish could feel pain, that, that you know, a, a tree that was in the middle of a paddock with no other trees around it possibly does feel lonely, you know. Yeah. Um, all those, you know, so all those things that, that you know, science, you know, our scientific rational selves had said that, you know, we're, we're not, you know, as we, we wanted to control the world and, and rule it and make it rational, um, that we sort of ruled out, are all kind of coming back in as well. So that's where the and beauty and wonder come in as well. But yeah. they're also signs of, um, you know, potentially of the fact that, uh, you know, we may be almost down the point of no return in terms of, you know, heating the environment and, uh, upsetting its natural processes. And also the kind of response to that, it seems to me, because one of the things that struck me reading the book was, you know, that moment when something like that comes up on your, I'm only on Instagram, but on your Instagram feed, and you go, oh, you know, little mm. mammoth foot, oh, how cute, yes. you know, like, yes. Yes. when actually what we should be doing mm. is saying, mm. oh, my God, what are we going to do about this? Um, yes. Rick, in terms of that, um, you know, beauty is a big component of your book too, actually, yeah. isn't it? I mean, it's one of the one of the main essays, um, maybe just before we go to Paro, I think, is that the name of the seal? But yeah. no, before we go here, right. do you want to just talk a little bit about where that sits in your framework, that the beauty particularly and wonder? I could, I could listen to Delia do an entire <laughs> one hour like lecture on this because this is exactly the kind of stuff that has fascinated me my entire life mm -hmm. uh, and still does. And I think partly because I grew up in a cattle station in outback Queensland. So I was surrounded by the natural world, but I also had uh, a mother, my mum Deb, who is just so endlessly curious. You know, I call her a curious little hobbit um, because she's like four foot nothing. Um, one of my uncles called her a drought foal because she's tiny. Um, and, but she's, just, she's obsessed with the natural world and the little peculiarities of things and how they work. But also for the longest time, even after my parents divorced and these horrible things happened, we would still go out every other holidays to see my dad on whatever station he was on. And I remember I write about it in the book, but um, during one of the worst droughts, um, as it started to break, there was this big rainstorm on Kamado Station in the far west of New South Wales. 
and me and my brother found these things. They looked like trilobites, like they mm. they were tadpoles um, mm. in the in the river, uh, in the, sorry, in puddles that had formed. And they were they're called shield trip. I didn't know this at the time, but they looked like dinosaurs. Mm. And I'd never heard of these things. In fact, I hadn't heard it. I didn't know what they were until I was researching this book. And I'm like, I need to find out. And they only pop up, you know, once every seven or so years, whenever the rain comes. And me and my brother just happened to be there to kind of witness the birth of these little things. And I don't know, I, I find, you know, in the way that the old poets used to talk about the sublime, it's a real thing. And I think, you know, I'm coming to you from Bidjigal land, which is right next door um, to Gadigal, all part of the Eora nation. But, you know, the first peoples, not only the first storytellers, but the first um, and only people, I think, to truly understand the way the country speaks to you mm. um, in Australia. And I got a small glimpse of that as a kid and it's something I've tried to stoke and maintain. Mm -hmm. But uh, I will never truly understand what they know about the country. Mm -hmm. But that's the kind of stuff that, I mean, beauty is, I think I make the point in the book, beauty is about attention. Like you get this little moment where you get to pay attention to something and it feels like it lasts a thousand years. Um, and that is a gift, like that mm -hmm. is uh, amazing. And when you train yourself to look for those things, um, any little walk, like I've been stuck in my local government area of concern for three months. Mm -hmm now mm. and i'm not allowed more than five kilometers from home and i you know to borrow the phrase from that poor woman on the channel nine news i've done all of arncliff uh, like i've walked all <laughs> of arncliff but it is endlessly fascinating to me mm. still to do it mm. and it's i funny, love it because this is a, a gift as well you know i had a mother who was a noticer as well and i think that yeah training just um mm. i just it took me a long time to realize what that mm. was because we always used to joke me and her it's like where did i get this lust mm. for telling stories from me. And cause she's like, well, you didn't get it from your father. And then she's like, you didn't get it from me either. But she was underselling herself because I absolutely mm. did. Mm. It's interesting cause you both write about mothers in your books and they're, you know, they're, they're beautiful kind of running commentary in yours, Rick, and that wonderful essay in yours, Delia. But it seems to me too that, you know, if you have a persona in the writing of your books that is most sort of dominant, I suppose, it's sort of child for you, Rick, you know, dealing with this little person mm. who had this trauma. And in a way it feels to me like it's mother for you, Delia, you know, that, that although the writer and teacher come in, that there's this sense, I had this sense reading them in tandem of mm. I kind of wish that you'd mothered Rick, you know. <laughs> I kind of wish yeah. you'd mothered, fathered, let's say, fathered. Yes. Um, but, you know, um, but how important parenting is. So do I, actually, Delia. Whether it be the... <laughs> I mean, whether it be the individual child or the planet, that that mm. sense of custodianship, and I mean, we say it in an, you know, in an acknowledgement of country that, that, that you know, that this custodianship is such an important thing. Um, and that's what we're probably in both your books seeing the consequences of when proper mm. custody was not sort of offered. Um, can I ask you to turn your attention to your seals? So both <laughs> these writers write about seals, but very different ones, and they're not aware of each other's seals So because um, they haven't had a chance to look at the books. So in Delia's book, a seal sort of rocks up into the local park, just comes for a season oh, and stays, and it has this incredible impact on that little area. Um, so... I'll get you to talk about yours first and then Rick will have your mad seal. <laughs> um, well, just behind where I'm sitting now, so just sort of behind my computer by a block, um, is an inner eastern suburbs park where a 200-kilo uh, fur seal turned up at the top of what we call the dog step. So the City of Sydney Council, you know, sort of has, you know, in its endless beautification processes has um, put little steps down to all the little beaches and usually they're used sort of by the local dog owners. And so this seal had found one, sort of, you know, come up one night and spotted by, a um, you know, an early morning job Jogger, you know, on the on the concrete path that she was going around, and he was reported in, um, and uh, he became um, quite a quite a thing in Sydney. So you know, all our visual storytellers, you know, which is about half my suburb now, uh, were all you know <laughs> down by the water making little video clips about him. And I became really, and of course, I was taking my twins, who were um, eight then, I think, down to to see him as well. And uh, I was really fascinated by the way that we dealt with this, uh, what would have once been a sort of a rogue animal. And again, 
We don't know if Sylvester had, um, as he was called, um, I, I, said to, I said to my partner as soon as he had a name out of the kid's earshot, I, I think as soon as he's got a name, I'm a bit worried because most animals that get a name, you know, things don't go very well for them. Um, <laughs> that, was, that was the opposite of um, our house. Mum said if you name an animal, they don't get killed. So. Uh, <laughs> That's well. true. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so um, he became this sort of, you know, sort of, sort of small tourist site you know of course it's pre-covid so people were coming from all over to look at him and the orca people were there and but then we started to have various debates open up um on our very lively local facebook page um uh about whether he was our our neighbor and how we should treat him and some people felt that our you know our neighborhood was so lovely and um uh, such lovely sort of real estate and such a great spot that, you know, of course he would choose our suburb. <laughs> and I'm kind of fascinated by the way that Facebook groups, local Facebook groups become these kind of cheerleading sort of, you know, sort of almost cult-like sort of uh, um, things. But, uh, and then, but then there was the issue of whether he should be allowed to stay there, whether he should um, be relocated somewhere um, that was safer for him and other people. Um, and so the, the debate really became quite real. So I just became very fascinated um, in this in this chapter that I wrote about how we were lavishing so much attention on this one animal out of place. Again, perhaps out of some anxiety that we don't know if he had been chased off his fishing grounds as Richard Flanagan has, you know, sort of written about so so well with the Tasmanian salmon farms. You know, most of the seals um, come from um, uh, off off um, the coast near Naruma, so he was sort of out of place. Um, whether he'd come here because the harbour's regenerated and it's full of fish, you know, more fish now in spite of the day that I didn't see them very much. It's generally, <laughs> um, generally, um, you know, in much better shape than it's been in. And so I was kind of fascinated by this animal that turned up in, you know, what is now one of the, you know, most sort of crazily um, gentrified <laughs> and wealthy parts of, of Sydney. Um, you know, it was kind of almost the perfect place for him to turn up in a way. Um, but, um, you know, and it made me think about the way that our inner cities are, you know, sort of such little islands and so, um, you know, sort of protected from what's going on in the rest of the country where we actually have the, I think, the highest rate of mammal extinction in the in the world. Um, and so all these, I just wanted to use that moment, um, you know, up until, I'm sorry, spoiler alert, um, uh, uh, Sylvester's ultimate sort of demise where, where the Taronga Zoo came to dart him, to take him off for treatment. Turned out he was quite ill. He had one eye that was blind and, um, you know, various other issues, although not everyone in the neighbourhood sort of believed that and there was quite some oh. sort of conspiracy about um, whether or not he had been, um, <laughs> you know, sort of... He knew um, too much. He yes, knew too much. Um, but, yeah, I wanted to trace that because I just found it was such a um, such an interesting way and to look at my, my own reactions where you know, my own sense was, well, of course he should be, you know, taken out somewhere where he could, um, you know, have, have a bit more of a kind of a non-touristy sort of life for himself. Um, there are other seals sort of around the harbour that, that have that. Um, but there was a quite a sort of a, a sense of um, anti-expertise, I suppose. Uh, I probably I probably line up too much with the sort of the animal experts, and um, then there was a another school of thought which was that well, you know, a bit like vaccinations. What would the experts know about um, <coughs> about seal behaviour? And so I just I, you know, and of course this point at which um, Sylvester had turned up um, is the point where tiny little micro bats come out every night and 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 buzz about over the water. So we were putting all this attention into one wonder or one sort of celebrity animal. And uh, it seemed to me that perhaps this was kind of symptomatic of our tendency to kind of focus again on these individual and um, atomized sort of moments of of wonder and feel, you know, we're doing, we're, we're doing well with the, the, the natural world uh, and um, perhaps not to, you know, not to focus on the on the bigger picture. I suppose that's ultimately the, the position that, that I came to. 
or whether or not, in fact, he was a sign or a wonder. You know, that was That's the thing. Right. I, I yeah. remember going to visit. I saw him in the park and I remember go, when I was so thrilled when you wrote about it. But I remember <laughs> it, all I saw was that it was a wonder and it took me mm. ages to think, mm. oh, because it's the anthropomorphizing too that we yes. do. You know, yeah. he, you write about the fact that he chose your park. That's right. You know, that, yeah. That's right. um, Rick has a rather delicious story about a seal. Do you say Paro? Is that his name? His name? Yeah, I mean, that's what he's called. Um, yeah. and I don't even so, know if it stands for anything. But it's just yeah. his name. Well, uh, would you I, tell no. the story? Because it's entirely about vulnerability, this one. It's beautiful. Well, yeah. I was obsessed with Paro when I learned about him years ago, but I was writing, I'll tell you what he is, don't worry, I'm not going to skip over <laughs> that part, but I was, I was writing a chapter on touch and I really, I mean, before I knew what every single chapter in this book would be, I knew there was going to be a chapter on touch. Um, and I made an excuse, and this makes me sound incredibly middle class now, but I made an excuse to use part of my book advance to go to Japan um, to interview can the I, inventor. Can of, I interrupt yeah. for one second just to say on touch that it's quite confronting. The opening of the book, for those who haven't read it, is mm. when you say you're going to pay someone to hold you. Yes. <laughs> And I was, co <laughs> yes, sorry, just talk about that for a moment before you go to Paro no, because it's really I was, heartbreaking. It started out as a joke, to be quite honest. I'm like, you know, I, I'm going to write this really difficult chapter about how I've kind of got this hunger in my skin that I had for a decade because I refused to hug anyone and romantically or friend-wise or anything. I just didn't have contact. And it's the most important sense in a way because it's the one we crave the most, but we normally don't know that it's so important because we normally get enough throughout our lives, either until you're very old um, or if you shut yourself off from the world. And so I wanted to kind of start the chapter with something a bit more lighthearted. And I was, I'd was i seen documentaries about cuddle parties where I think John Safran went to a cuddle party where you just kind of like in a room with all these strangers and you're rolling around and you're hugging. It's non-sexual, or at least that's what they tell you. Um, <laughs> And, but then I realised there's, when I was researching those, I realised that there are standalone hug therapists um, who will literally, like, you know, it's like a psych or a GP, but you go there and you just get held however you prefer. And in my case, I was just going to be like, hug me, hold me for 45 minutes to this woman, um, Jasmina. And, of course, you know, I started doing all of these things just before COVID became a thing. So um, I'd already, you know, I'd already I'd done the research. I'd... I'd um, I hadn't made the booking yet, but I was about to. And then, of course, the whole world shut down. But one of the things I wanted to explore was this idea that we we need that contact. And there was this Japanese scientist, Dr. Um, Shibata, who invented this seal. It's like a, a big fluffy dog, really, but it's a, it's based on a, a harp seal, like a baby harp seal. And he it's this device with like four or five different motors. It's got fins. It looks like a beautiful, cuddly toy. But it's used in nursing homes in particular for elderly patients who don't get visitors. And I remember when Ken White was in, um, in aged care minister in Australia, um, there was this one stat that he said at one point during a speech, it was like in any given year in Australia, 45 or 47% of people in aged care don't get a single visitor, um, whether it's from family or friends. And it's just, I mean, that was just devastating. And here's this, Japanese scientist who's, you know, been involved. Of course, it's robots, of course. But I, I just I wanted to go and talk to him. So I went to this nursing home in um, Tokyo. I met with him there. And I'm like, why a seal? Like, why, why not a dog or a cat? Because that's what everyone's got, right? And he's like, exactly. He's like, people know what to expect from a dog or a cat. They know how they move and they behave. And a seal, he's like, they know what a seal is. They know they're cute, but they don't know enough about their physiology or their behaviour or their mannerisms to actually be able to tell. Basically, what he's saying is that it would spoil the experience if you knew too much about what the animal was. And I was prepared to be sceptical, right? Because I'm like, obviously, nothing's going to replace real human touch. And it's obviously worth trying, but I wasn't sure that this was really kind of all it was cracked up to be. And then, and then he introduced me to the seal. And like they had stacks of them. They had like twelve, they were like little slippers in these little um, pigeonholes. And then there was this old resident playing with one and they handed me the seal. And I write about it in the book and it sounds like I'm being melodramatic, but I'm not kidding. I would die for power of the seal. <laughs> like if someone came into a bank while I was holding, I don't know why I would take my seal to a bank, but, you know, stranger things have happened. And if someone came in and said, you know, your money or the seal gets it, mm -hmm. um, 
I would give them everything I have um, just to protect that thing. It is so, it was so disturbing how quickly I guess I felt um, drawn in by it. And yet it was also, and it is, I won't bore you with it, but there's a bunch of studies done about, you know, how good this thing is and things like it for dementia, um, for lowering your heart rate, which pets are also very good at. But in, in certain environments where you've got fear of infection, it's not always an option. Um, but also lowering the risk of severe behaviour um, or problematic behaviour in dementia residents. It's just a phenomenal thing. And all of this stuff comes from touch, mm. which I'm, I love. I love it. And it's so interesting to me that, that the animal, you know, that we go to the animal, whether it be a teddy bear or para the seal or whatever, but we don't necessarily make the leap to the real world then. And the fact that these animals, we, we look for them to give us this comfort, but we're not necessarily mm. being custodians of them in the real world. Um, I'm aware of time and there's so much ground to cover and I really, really, really want to go to one particular essay of Delia's because it leads into a, a punch in the stomach moment for me in Rick's. So Delia writes an essay about the paragraph. It's called The Disappearing Paragraph. So for those of you who think it's only a book about animals and um, climate, Delia extends that into what it's doing to our inner lives in ways that are, to me, utterly surprising. And one of them is that we're losing the paragraph. Um, and she talks about the floating paragraph. And it was very familiar to me, you know, this thing that once upon a time we saw a long page and an indentation. And then there was sort of a rhythm about that that was familiar. But now, of course, we've got these white spaces and things. Delia, I'm going to get you to talk about this. But um, it... It made me change the way I read your book and Rick's book immediately when I read that. So would you just talk about how that, how you pull that, those strands together? First? Yeah, look, it's interesting because that's the essay where, I mean, I do write about books quite a lot and, and you know, as I say, that is my ecotone. So I notice I'm trying to track these changes across a whole set of different things from sort of science to, you know, to, to theories about the, uh, the world and, and so forth. But, um, yeah, so, look, I thought this is the essay where I kind of really, I'm just going to have fun with this one. I'm just going to push the boat out uh, with this. And I'd been noticing that um, a lot of writing I was reading um, was written and I guess Jenny Offal's books would be the 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 one that p people would think of most most easily and be most familiar with, where they're written in what I call these little bricks of text, so um, justified bricks of bricks of text with a with a space in between. Now, I'm a I'm a nerdish reader. I spend so much time <laughs> doing books, and I teach creative writing as well. And I just have have been obsessed since I began writing with what happens in spaces in text, what happens in that space. Now, in, there's a theory for it in Chinese painting, which is that um, you draw the white, that, that it is qi, it is energy. Um, I don't think we have the language and the way of thinking about what space means uh, in, in prose um, particularly. And so, of course, it sort of fascinates me. And I just noticed that the, it's so many more... Um, book texts were being written. I was, I was coming across these, these things, whether it's lyric essays or whether it was novels, that were written in these little tiny justified bricks of text that had a space in between them. So you sort of read a bit, kind of almost take, take a pause, read another bit, take a pause. And so your reading experience is very different to that kind of, you know, to the Victorian novels um, yeah. where, you know, it was kind of all about, it was almost like they were almost like the kind of the heavy Victorian furnished room and there was this sense about the unflowing paragraphs that and I, I kind of go into some of the, not, not too boringly or, or too much detail, I hope, but I go into some of the um, Victorian books of, of prosody and how, you know, there was this idea that each paragraph with each indent kind of opened up a little arena of thought and then each one kind of passes meaning like a little bucket chain and 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 you read those books and you feel like the world is an ordered place a progressive place where you know everything is kind of each idea is kind of move, going to move along in its own time perhaps quite a lot of time from one paragraph to the next i think virginia wolf talks about hazlitt styles being like the chimes of a hammer on an anvil yeah. you know um, and I thought, well, what is going on? Why are we, you know, why are these books sort of, why is what I'm reading on the page, you know, being written in fragments? And um, so I was, I was thinking about that as a, just again, the way that so much of um, 
you know, so much of what this moment of being in the Anthropocene sort of means in a way is that everything that was kind of graphable or chartable or predictable, all those patterns, whether it was the big, the seasons or, um, uh, you know, sort of pro progress towards, you know, sort of a better future, all of these things are, I'm, I'm smiling, but it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's deadly serious are uh, being, um, you know, uh, we have this sense that things are becoming, uh, that, are un that, 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 that the atmosphere is unravelling that weather's unravelling. And so I kind of played with the idea that perhaps paragraphs were, you know, we were we were reading in a different way um, with these little paragraphs that were almost kind of, um, you know, was deliberately in, in Offal's case, but I think um, perhaps less deliberately in other, other texts, kind of giving us a visual sense of what, you know, how life was kind of, Flying at us in bright splinters, I think, is the expression that um, the writer David Shields uses. So that's um, I play with that in the. I could go on, but I, I really yes. play with that in that essay. And it's wonderful because it does actually make you look at things and also look at the spaces. And you reference the idea of isolation, mm -hmm. you know, these and how that it might be uh, a sort of a depiction of us in the world. So. I then I was going between the books at this point and I happened to be reading Rick the sequence mm. that comes after your description of the rape that is really your first experience of sex and mm. it's a devastating mm. sequence to read and then there's this moment where you put one sentence you don't put white either side of it but there was one sentence and it literally was like a punch to the stomach. And the sentence is, I have no mercy. I can barely say it without crying. Hmm. Now, partly I think you, you separated it. And after reading Delia's, I thought, mm, well, he could have actually put that next sentence yeah. up there. You know, that's really an interesting choice. I'd like you to just, if you wouldn't mind, talk about that mm. a little, both as a writer and as what you're doing, but also the use of the word mercy, because it feels to me like you could have said, I have known kindness. You could have said, I have known love. Mercy is such a big kind of biblical concept that we don't talk about much. And it seems to fit yeah. with signs and wonders. So over to you. I, that, that whole chapter it was really difficult to write, but also, uh, I didn't write about it in there, but there was something that had happened in my own life uh, where I had done wrong in a in a really big, public, awful way and where I didn't do anything about it when I should have. And then I followed up with the person who was at the, the kind of the end of that kind of, you know, my harm. And they were so gracious. Like they were so gracious and they did not need to be. They were gracious. They were understanding. Um, mm. I did apologize properly, so it wasn't like I was being like, you know, I was going through something or this was that. I just said, look, I failed you, and I should have done better, and I should have done better. But like that was such a powerful, and this happened well before I started writing the book. But I was, I've not, I've not stopped thinking about it, and I think part of my thinking about that whole chapter was, you know, knowing the power of that that mercy and it was mercy like it wasn't kindness it wasn't even forgiveness even though they did say they forgive me it was bigger than that and I felt like in its own way even though you know I don't describe it as such this book is about learning to forgive uh my own self um, for other things that I, other harms I have committed against myself but also the harms that were committed on it by other people and I feel like if you if you want to go around believing that forgiveness is possible, then A, you have to be able to do it with yourself. Um, and if you can't do it with yourself, why would you even think that you could do it for other people? Or why would you believe it was real when you saw it in other people? And so this kind of kicked off a chain reaction, I guess, of thinking about things that had happened to me and things that I'd already been trying to do. Like I'm not out here saying that you need to forgive people who have sexually assaulted you, um, used like, I mean, I have, but that's not, that's my call. And certainly I'm not saying that you need to forgive, you know, mass atrocities or, you know, genocide or, you know, people saying, oh, well, maybe we can forgive the colonists in Australia. It's like, well, no, we haven't admitted to wrongdoing yet. <laughs> um, yeah. And that's part of the, the truth telling, right? And so I was thinking about all of these things and it just seemed to me very urgent that in order to see the world as possibly being capable of being better, 
you actually need to to show that that kindness, that mercy, and that love, um, not only to yourself but to those around you, um, including those who might be odious or who have done things. Um, I don't believe there are villains, um, say, for maybe a handful of people in human history, um, probably more than a handful, but you know what I mean. Um, mm. But in our everyday lives, I don't think villains exist. Mm. Well, it's an interesting thing because it, it raises a question from um, a writer called Sarah Santillas who wrote a fantastic book called Draw Your Weapons in which she says that um, she, she takes on the idea of empathy and I, I would like you both to comment on this. Um, and she says empathy as a mot motivator for behavioural change, both personally and societally. You know, we've, we've had this, we've lauded it really. We've said empathy is the great thing and indeed literature is, you know, the great sort of, empathy machine um, and she says that it depends on perceived likeness empathy you know we have to sort of make ourselves understand what it's like to be the other person but she says if it's only discovered likeness that creates the possibility for ethical behavior then what happens when we can't find likeness what actually happens then um, and she sort of says that the most difficult thing is to learn to live with and protect what we can't understand how do you respond to that? Because I think it's quite important for both your books. Yeah, it's, I mean, that is such an amazing sentiment. Mm. Uh, mm. I remember like during the same-sex marriage debate and I obviously, I'm gay and I wanted it to pass and I believed in it wholeheartedly and I hated the discrimination of it. Mm. But I also hated this idea that people were going around saying, we need to be tolerant. Um, we need to be tolerant of the gays who want to get married, but you've got to be tolerant of the people who would rather deny that to you. And I'm like, I hate this idea of tolerance because it implies just a kind of like a, a, a reluctant acceptance. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I don't want people to tolerate me. I want people to understand me. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, you know, they don't have to love what I do, um, but also, uh, you know, they should, and I should in return, try to see the foundation on which their lives are built. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, one of the main driving forces for me in my writing um, and, and hopefully my journalism as well, is to paint a, a, a fuller picture, I guess, of what people actually are and who they are. Mm -hmm. I'm flawed. I'm extremely flawed. I have made so many mistakes in my life. I don't think I'm a bad person. I do try and do better and get better um, as I get older, particularly as I learn more about the world. Um, but I do know that if someone had got to me or if social media had got to me in the way that it is now when I was 18, um, I probably would have been cancelled four times over because I didn't know enough about how to use language or, you know, I cared about people, but I didn't know that there were ways of caring about people that were, you know, more acceptable than others. And so all of these things, I'm just like, unless people have shown a, a, an absolute rejection of, you know, good mm -hmm. faith, then I think we need to find them where they are and 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 understand them for who they are. And I think I love that sentiment because... There are so many people whose lives are not like mine and will never be like mine and, and vice versa. But that doesn't mean they're unknowable to me and they shouldn't be unknowable. I think that's, mm. you know, that's our job is to know people. Mm. Mm. What about you, Delia? Yeah, look, my um, my personal beef in my book has been, I think, with that idea of wonder um, when it comes to the natural world. I think it has, I have this, a similar sort of sense, I think, that that Rick has about tolerance, you know, that, um, you know, it's up to us to wonder to, you know, is it, is it accept, you know, is it exceptional or not? <clears throat> is it worthy of my attention? And, um, the word that keeps coming around in, in my head, which I can, can't unpack now, but, you know, I, I, I just kept thinking was, um, well, two words, grace and compassion, I think are the, are the two words that, that, that come to me in a, a more sort of, me, you know, more meaningful. Um, and for me, grace, I suppose, would have a, you know, it's such an old fashioned word and I don't, I, you know, I don't really want the sort of the religious connotations of it, I suppose. But I'm, you know, it's, it feels old fashioned, I think, because it's, it suggests a calm, it suggests a, a kind of a, a surplus of, attention and of um uh of of a kind of a um a warmth around things i suppose so i think you know i, I think that part of our problem in terms of um being in a an era of sort of signs and wonders and of of this 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 kind of moment that we find ourselves in is that we have become 
you know, to, to sound judgment, rather graceless. And, um, you know, we have um, reduced our attention to the, min to, to the most instrumentalised minimum amount of attention that a particular animal could get or a particular um, social plight, um, a particular minority, you know, that, that we have been so grudging. We're seeing that now with our health system. We've stripped that down to the bare sort of minimum and the most instant thought in the most instrumental, um, uh, you know, economically rationalist um, ways. And that for me, the word grace suggests, uh, you know, I suppose that's the sort of the, the, the best Western word I can I can come up with, you know, Western inverted commas, whereas, you know, I think that those concepts are, have, you know, that we've ignored have been so clearly um, available, um, you know, or so, you know, have so clearly existed within um, many Indigenous cultures relation to the world, the idea of um, things working together in a in an eco, what we would call an ecosystem, but a but a cosmology. Um, those are the, you know, for me, grace is my closest equivalent. I could, I suppose, um, come out out of the traditions that that I have grown up thinking out of. But of course, I think that you know um, that those answers are way ahead. Um, in you know, and I've tried to engage with in my book with some of those 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 concepts. But of course, not wanting to appropriate them mm -hmm. either um, is a little bit difficult. So so grace kind of fills that space for me in terms of um, a term that that I I think is is the most useful way forward. Mm. Thank you. They're beautiful answers. Um, and those words, you know, grace, mm. mercy, signs, wonders. Now, look, I've got to, I'm aware of the time. We've got to just check if there are questions and Anne-Marie's going to pop back in and let me know if there are. Um, there she is coming now as we speak. Hi. Hello. Um, mm. We have a couple of questions from your friend and colleague, Caroline Baum. Nice oh, to... Oh, hi, Caroline. <laughs> I love Caroline. <laughs> Um, back to around the, the seal story, I think Rick's story, Carol, Carol asked, do you think there is a connection between the kind of vulnerability and anxiety you touch on and the current epidemic of depression? Mm. I saw that question pop up and I'm trying to think about it as we're going without actually diving into a book and getting distracted. Yes, I mean, I think there is... I mean, vulnerability doesn't come without harm um, or, or, you know, some kind of hurt or understanding or even awareness, I guess, of how um, there's a great um, poem called Kindness by uh, the poet Naomi Shihab Nye, where she says, you know, you have to have known sorrow as the deepest thing. And then you see it catch the thread of all sorrows and you can see how great the cloth is. And I feel like once you've known anxiety or, or suffering or, or you've been vulnerable with those things, it's kind of like getting the secret code and you see it everywhere. And for me with trauma, I see it everywhere, particularly complex trauma. It's in the welfare system. It's in the mental health system. It's in um, health in general. Uh, it's in juvenile justice. It's in prisons, corrections. Um, everything you can think of where people suffer, it's usually because there has been an abuse of love, um, whether it's emotional neglect um, or just as other people say, a low level kind of lack of love. But I think, you know, I don't think the answer is to, to shut yourself off from those things. Um, I think the answer is to be realistic about their proportions and about what you can do in the face of that. And I, t I talk about it in my book, actually. It's kind of like being vulnerable is kind of like an inoculation. Um, mm -hmm. You get the more people that do it, it's like herd immunity. I know we probably don't want to talk about vaccination. The more people that do it, the safer you are because you realise everyone else is exactly the same. And can I say something on that from that section? The, the sentence there mm. that moved me the most in terms of what you're talking about was where you write that sorrow is a universal entitlement of our species. Yes. Now, I thought that was extraordinary because to use the word entitlement about sorrow felt to me like another very challenging moment. And in response to what Caro is asking, um, I just think that's really, an, yeah, it's deliberate. Challenging. It's deliberate. Mm, yeah, beautiful. I mean, it is. Beautiful. It is your. It is your right, and in fact, your destiny to be extremely mm. upset throughout this life. You don't escape it without any of those things. But you do also don't get the the flip side. I know it sounds trite or even cliched, but you know, to get the shading right in a life, you have to have known these things, and everyone has, which means that you are capable of seeing the reverse and seeing things 
in all of their glory and wonder, um, which is hard to get to. And it sounds, and it's taken me a long time to understand that. But when I did, I felt like I had been given, it sounds silly, but like a consolation prize, I guess, for all of that suffering. Um, but it's a good consolation prize. It's joy. Mm -hmm. Caro Emery, has another. Emery, yes, go. Mm. Uh, another great question that taps into that. Why doesn't our public health researcher acknowledge that concern about social issues such as climate, poverty, domestic violence, etc., impacts on the collective spirit of a nation? Delia, that's you first, I reckon. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, look, uh, one of my, you know, I, I can't speak to the you know the the public research um but i think that um we are entering a whole new world of feeling um and one of the things that motivated me was that um you know i think that that the lang the, the struggling to find a language for this moment and for um you know the 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 deep impact that i think um so many of us are feeling about you know the distress the the depression um you know around um the the way that we are you know perhaps irretrievably um, changing our world and you know ent heading towards you know potentially what one um, uh, one critic has called the the age of loneliness the eremocene uh, which is a terrifying mm. idea um, is that you know I was fasc fascinated by trying to be precise about what those feelings were myself and trying to explore them. And I don't think they're simple. I think, you know, we like simple things, but they are often multifaceted and, um, you know, quite, quite ambiguous. Um, so, you know, one, one point in my book, I look at um, some of the attempts that people have been making. And I think it's, this is just a, a start to try and um, just express um, that, that level of feeling. So, so there's a um, an anthropologist called um, Glenn Ulbricht who who coined the term um, solastalgia uh, for feeling homesick uh, in place. And I think that that is one of so. And those those abilities to name things, I think, are also um, you know, it's not it's not social research. It's you know, coming from a, a different field of just of of you know what I can do as a you know creative writer, I suppose. And what I'm watching other people do is. Um, you know, to to try and find ways of expressing, you know, because if, if you you know if you can put something into words, you can start mm. to hopefully try and and turn things around. So, uh, I find solastalgia a very strong term, and also um, Elizabeth uh, Flux in her book Rising, which is um, about looking at um, sea level rise, which of course is already occurring and destroying communities and uh, you know um, and 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 places, familiar places, and and creating all sorts of future sort of and and ongoing social problems. She describes the feeling as um as end sickness, a kind of vertigo of <laughs> of the anticipation of um you know of of again this the gravity of of what we're doing so um i think that those f f um you know that 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 is something that can you know come from writing and hopefully feed into um you know into the into research as well is the um is just trying to put you know some sort of terms on to the you know something that is so so enormous that it's almost unthinkable but we have to think it we're living it. Yeah. Yeah. We're here. Mm. That's terrifying. Marie, but where, yes. <laughs> where are we up to? Sorry. <laughs> well, on that, on the question of mercy and forgiveness, big call, can you forgive climate deniers? <laughs> I, I think you can. I think you can. I mean, it, I mean, I don't think you can. I make this point about anger as well, but like, I don't think you, I, I don't like being angry at people, even people within bad systems. I get angry at systems and governments that propagate them or keep them in place, you know, things like the welfare system that hurt the poor. And similarly, governments that take inaction on climate change. And, uh, but I think human beings are complicated creatures. Like there are oil executives out there who are completely driven by, by self-interest. 
um, who may actually believe some of the spin, maybe not the oil executives, but some other people who are climate deniers may actually believe that it's not real. Um, mm -hmm. But they will have families and their families will suffer, right? And um, I'm not going to be jumping for joy when that happens. Um, and I think I, the best thing I can say about forgiveness, um, and I'll let Delia have the last word on this, but it's not about them. It's about you. Like mm -hmm. you have to be able to move on and and live in the world as it is. And I don't, I don't want to pay those people rent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's essentially the way I look at it. Well, I don't feel it's up to me to, you know, forgive or, or you know, not not forgive anyone in this scenario. But I think that, um, you know, the difficulty is that we all kind of need to know, you know, in broad terms what what we need to do. But it's it's very often, and and sometimes I think that, you know, the if you want to call it the neoliberal model is to you know, to, to take the responsibility from companies and from governments and uh, make us assume the cost of, of things and make us, you know, assume the individual responsibility. If only I recycled more, you know, the world would be okay. Yes. Whereas very often the case that, you know, it's it's something like 25 companies, I think, are some of them, you know, creating, you know, an enormous percentage of the um, global heating technologies and, and pollution. You know, it's it's very often the case that we you know, even the term Anthropocene, we direct attention uh, too much at the, you know, perhaps at the kind of individual level, um, which of course we should be responsible, of course should we, we should be pushing for, mm. you know, for change. But um, it is sometimes a way of blinding us, I think, to the much bigger, um, you know, the, the, the much bigger systemic, um, you know, sort of areas of chief responsibility um and we can you know spend a lot of time thinking about you know our own uh choices um when i think that you know we could be better informed about um where some of the the major damage is coming from yeah 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 <laughs> well that's probably not a bad place for us to start to think about farewelling albury for this year mm -hmm. um i do just I wanted to, both of the writers to read just a little tiny bit because it's so pleasurable to hear the actual bits. Have we got time, Anne-Marie, for two tiny readings, just half a Go, page? Go for it. So, dear, do you <laughs> want to just read the beginning because it's a slightly shorter section and it's still very beautiful? And then, Rick, would you give us that? Because I just think being read to is deep pleasure for all of us anyway in these voices. So first two paragraphs? Yeah. No. All right. Um, a few years ago, I found a bird's nest on the footpath, a beautiful thing of loosely woven she-oak needles lined with pale grey fur. I held it cupped in my hand as I continued onto the train from our inner city suburb and walked through the long pedestrian tunnel to the edge of Sydney's central business district. The joyful attention it attracted surprised me. That's a little noisy miner's nest you've got there, a woman told me as she passed. Lovely, another called out. But when I reached the university and showed it to my student, a man my own age, his face fell. This meant a bird had lost its home, he said. Did I know, he asked, that when the harbour bridge was first built, crows made their nests on its high trusses? But when they went out to search for food, the architecture was so repetitive that even these clever birds couldn't find their way back to their chicks. I smiled a little to myself at my student's tragic cast of mind. Recent high winds had blown down this nest, a small drama innocent as far as I knew of any human interference. Yet I was all too familiar myself with a sense of wonder that flipped over quickly into apprehension about our impact on the natural world. Were the still evenings of a gloriously prolonged summer reason to rejoice or evidence of disrupted climate patterns? Was it great good fortune while driving in a remote part of the country to have seen a koala bundling along by the roadside with her joey on her back or an indicator of distress? Over the last few years, these trains of thought have multiplied. Is what I am witnessing normal or abnormal, a good or a bad sign? And above all, is it due somehow to us? Thank you. I can't wait for your book, Delia. Oh, <laughs> this yes. is like extremely Venn diagram of all of my interests. Um, I'm going to be really quick. Likewise, uh, I'm very much looking forward to reading yours, Rick. Mm. Uh, Don't be quick, Rick. Just read it. it. <laughs> no, no, I'll read it. I'll read it. Um, uh, um, not all vulnerabilities will be received well by all people. Some will be exploited. You may show your most true self to someone and be laughed at or met with disdain. Still, choose to do this. There is liberty in it. 
it struck me while writing this book that expressing myself and being open to the world was an inoculation. Suddenly, I didn't care what other people thought about me. To be more precise, I didn't care to the same crippling degree as before. The more of us who do it, the safer we are, a kind of herd immunity for the mind. There is a point not too far down this path where you will be greeted with the kind of knowledge that could move Earth itself. Everyone else is the same as you. Some people spend all their allotted time on this planet wondering what that freedom might feel like. Thank That's you me. both. Thank, thank you, you both and thanks, Anne-Marie. Um, can I just remind you all that Delia's book, Signs and Wonders, can be ordered at the moment. It's coming out at the end of September um, and you can order it online and I'm sure you can order it through Dimmox in Albury. And of course, Rick's book can be bought now and if you're in Albury, you can actually order it and they will deliver it by hand to your very door. But of course, anyone watching anywhere else, both those books can be ordered from your local bookstore. And um, I can't think of anything better. In fact, as you saw at the beginning of the session, just being in the presence of this book will take you away mm. from a screen. Um, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all for coming. Thank you so much to you two for writing these absolutely beautiful books. And thank you, Anne-Marie, for... Um, bringing us the festival and over to you because it's your last session. Oh, well, it's my pleasure. I just want to, yeah, thank you, Rick. Thank you, Delia. Thank you, Ailsa, for your beautiful weaving. Thank of you, Ailsa. These yes, two amazing are. brains and books mm. <laughs> in it's such beautiful. a rich conversation. Um, and, yeah, thank you to all our audience for tuning in. Uh, we really appreciate it. We've really missed missed the live gathering more than ever this year. I'm sorry we didn't get to everyone's questions. Um, and yeah, look, stay tuned. Let's hope we're back in real life next year. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. You. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank, Thank you so much, Alpha. That was nourishing. Yeah, it's beautiful to talk. <laughs>